This week's episode was sponsored by Michael Bertrand on Patreon. So thank you very much, Michael. And for your generosity, you're going to get your initials, MDB, sewn into the old tapestry back there. So let's do that now. Magic. Haha, <laughs> y'all didn't know I had smoke powers, did you? But yeah, thank you very much, Michael. If you would like to be generous like Michael, head over to my Patreon. Uh, there's a link in the description below. And if for some reason your initials happen to be MJB, all the better because there's a chance that I am really bad at reading and misread what, what Michael Bertrand's initials were in the message he sent me and ended up making this patch before I made the right one. So um, this is ready for any MJBs out there with um, a generous spirit. In any case, let's start the episode. <sighs> Hello, nitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm your host, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host, what's his name? And today I'm finally giving you blood-sucking bunch of jackals exactly what you want. Another episode of my stupid deep dive into America's Next Top Model Cycle 6. I hope you're happy, you stupid little bastards. As the comments have repeatedly reminded me, it's been quite a long time since my last one of these, and there are a lot of good reasons for that, which I'm going to go over now, so maybe you can just shut up for one second! Sorry, sorry, that, that's harsh. I'm kind of a mean drunk. The first reason is just scheduling stuff. Between the holidays and the fact that there were other videos I wanted to do, I haven't had time to get one of these out until now. I, I wish I was better at time management, but I'm not, and seeing as I can never seem to find the time to try and get better at it, I've decided to instead just accept that this is who I am. The second reason is that this particular episode I'm about to talk about has two photo shoots in it, and given that I have, for some reason, committed myself to recreating said photo shoots, I wanted to wait a little bit after the holidays before that happened because, well, I've spent the better part of the last two months subjecting my body to what can only be described as the nutritional equivalent of viciously beating someone with a sack of oranges, so I wanted to give myself a couple of weeks of diet and exercise before I go taking photos of myself for public consumption. Also, my dog somehow managed to piss on the sweater I wear to film these, so I had to wait a while while I got that dry cleaned. I don't know how she managed to find it or why she decided to piss on it once she did, but she's perfect and I don't question her methods, I just work with her decisions. And finally, the biggest reason that this video has been put on the back burner for so long now is the simple fact that the idea of making it is daunting as fudge. Like, if we're being honest, those other three reasons I gave were just filler, because this is the real reason I've been putting it off for so long, but I felt silly just coming on here and saying that I'm genuinely afraid to make a YouTube video where I talk about a dumb reality show from 2006, because... Well, based solely on that description, I couldn't possibly imagine anything sounding lower stakes than that. But the truth is, I am scared. Like, I'm not complaining, but the fact of the matter is that each new video I make is going out to a larger and larger audience. And while that's great, it's what I wanted, it also means that I feel more and more pressure on me with each passing episode that I make. I think about the first video I made in this series back when I was a fresh-faced young content creator with gross oily hair that I hadn't groomed in a year and a half, and I honestly don't think that I ever thought that this is where I'd end up. Like, don't get me wrong, if I told 
that greasy troll about how much his channel has grown in the past year, he'd be genuinely thrilled. But if I then told him that he'd spend many a stressful day trying to word stuff just right, lest he fuck something up royally and ended up ruining his reputation by putting a horrible take on the internet for all to see, he'd probably be confused and be like, y you know we're making videos about the Tyra Banks show, right? When I started making these videos, I honestly thought it would be fun and easy, you know? I'd come on here, react to a couple of clips of the show that I genuinely love, make a few bad jokes, and then cut to the puppet saying something mean about me. And while I do have a lot of fun doing the show, I cannot say that it's easy. For as mind-numbingly stupid as ANTM is, it's also insanely complex. And Figuring out how to talk about it in a way that I feel comfortable with the public seeing has consumed a large portion of my last year and turned me into the mess of a person you see before you rambling incoherently in an effort to put off actually talking about this episode and swinging wine directly out of the bottle. Although hearing myself say that out loud, I'm realizing what a bad look the wine is, so like... I should probably fix that. Which like, for the record, the phrase that I feel comfortable with the public seeing is key there because please know that if I were just talking about this shit in my normal life, this would be a million times easier. Like nobody who knows me personally would ever describe me as thoughtful or capable of compassion. So I would 1 million percent be talking about this show a lot differently where I just shooting the shit with people who aren't online. Unfortunately, since I don't really know any of those, I instead had to take things to YouTube and that's where things got, um, complicated. Putting stuff out online opens me up to the possibility that countless people will see it and with them they'll bring their own thoughts and opinions, and those thoughts and opinions are often not going to be on my side. And that being the case, it makes me want to try and guess what all those thoughts and opinions might be and address them before they become an issue, because even if 99% of them are bound to be shit that I find stupid and don't care about and are ultimately just people responding to the fact that they find my voice annoying, I don't want to accidentally ignore the 1% of them that I actually think are worth a damn. So I do my best to look at these episodes from every possible angle to make sure that I address everything that I might need to address so that when I do get those legitimate criticisms, then I can at least say that I thought things through and I stand by the thing that I made on some level. And well, unfortunately for me, when you do look at this damn show through a microscope like that, you start seeing all sorts of just like little microscopic flesh-eating bacterias that weren't perceptible to you at first, just wriggling around underneath the surface, waiting for the opportunity to latch onto you and eat your face off. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Although I guess there was actually a literal flesh-eating bacteria scare in Cycle 4, but I'm pretty sure in the end that turned out to be a different skin condition. M Michelle was just fine. A lot of blackface in that episode. And I guess this is all just a long-winded way of saying that though it seems like just a simple, stupid, over-the-top television show on its surface, if you think about it for literally any amount of time, you realize that there's a lot more going on here. Looking at the show as closely as I do makes Top Model go from feeling like fun, trash television to like, like an ethical thought experiment. and. Seeing as I got a B- in the only philosophy class I ever took, I 
don't always feel fully qualified to tackle the complex moral issues that it brings up sometimes. And honestly, I don't think I've ever seen an episode of television, top model or otherwise, which brings up more complex moral issues than the one I'm about to talk about today because like, how do I say this eloquently? This shit is fucked up. There is so much terrible crap crammed into this hour or so of television that I truly don't know where to start talking about it. But since I have committed myself to making this series like the stupid bitch that I am, I feel like I have no choice but to figure it out. And I guess that the best way to start a thing is to just start. So here we go. Like I said, I'm feeling very in over my head with this one, so feel free to tell me all the ways I fucked it up in the comments, and I'll do my best to read everything you guys have to say and take it in as best as I can. Just, like, be nice about it if you can. But yeah, with that out of the way, let's get this shit show started by talking about Cycle 6, Episode 7, The Girl Who Has Surgery. Damn it. So like I've said before, every episode of Top Model has an underlying lesson that kind of ties everything that they do that week together. As best I can tell, they start with a broad topic that's something a model would need to know about, and then they build all their lessons and challenges and photo shoots around that. And Though they usually build them in such an over-the-top and ghoulish way that it's not always immediately apparent what specific nuggets of wisdom they were trying to impart on the contestants, Tyra will usually come in at the end and state outright what the theme of the week was, and when she does that, if you think back on the episode, you'll usually be like, oh, okay, I get what they were going for. And I honestly don't think I can properly discuss this episode without saying what the lesson of the week is up front, because while it is immediately apparent to anyone with a conscience that a lot of what happens over the course of this episode is incredibly horrific, when you actually stop and take a second to look at these challenges through the lens of the lesson and do the thing where you think, oh, okay, I get what they were going for things start to feel so much worse than you ever thought possible. And you know, rather than rambling on, why don't I let Tyra tell you what that lesson is? Welcome, ladies. Hey. Or should I say, welcome, ladies? Because you learned about the ugly side of modeling this week. And like, if hearing Tyra say that fills you with a dread so deep that you fear it may one day consume your soul, then good. You've been paying attention. If this episode has a thesis, it's that modeling has the potential to ruin you in a lot of different ways, but instead of, like, teaching the girls how to not let it ruin them, instead the show just kind of turns all the things that might ruin them into a series of challenges and lessons and photo shoots and then it judges the girls on their ability to not be ruined. And just in case that didn't sound monstrous enough, while the show is subjecting the contestants to challenges related to the ugly side of modeling, it's also subjecting quite a few of them to the actual ugly side of modeling. And while I don't know if it was intentional, it does create this cool play within a play sort of thing that makes the episode a lot more interesting than a lot of other entries in the series. There's so much horrible in this episode that they have to get things started a lot quicker than usual in order to fit it all in. So after a brief check-in with the girls up front, we jump straight into this week's challenge. And boy, howdy, is it a doozy. The girls are told that they'll be meeting with a woman named Dupreece, which right off the bat, not a good sign. I, w I would never trust anyone named Dupreece. 
Sorry to any Dupreeses who may be watching this right now. We're told that Dupreece is the most sought after creative director in the world and for the girls challenge it's their job to impress her. Uh, unfortunately for the girls this is a complete lie because Dupreece is actually an actress who's been instructed to viciously insult them in ways that I would not wish upon my worst enemy. I'm an actress and the former model and I'm pretending to be a really intense mean creative a agency director. I'm gonna give them some really harsh criticism about their physical looks. The challenge for the girls is to see if they can handle the brutal side of the modeling business because it happens all the time. Dupreece basically just looks at the girls portfolios and shits on their physical appearances in a way that a bunch of young women in their early 20s probably don't really need in their lives. Also bonus points for casual transphobia. I need to see your stomach because your stomach is looking a little big here. You gotta work on that stomach a little bit more. <clears throat> this stomach is definitely. I don't know what happened with that picture. Well, you know what? Your stomach's not looking that good in person either. She looks like a transvestite. Look at that face. Come on. She has issues. I think I'm cute. I don't think I look like a drag queen. When they're done having a total stranger say all of their greatest insecurities out loud, the girls are asked to pose for a Polaroid photo. And this is where the real challenge begins because the winner here is going to be judged based on how well they're able to convincingly smile after they've been made to feel like shit for about 20 minutes straight. I wish I was making this up, but the, the show flat out says that that's what's going on here. Um, he's gonna take some Polaroids of you. We're gonna keep you on file. Okay. Just want a natural smile. It's important to be able to shake this off and do your job. And they will catch that in a Polaroid when you could see the effectiveness in a lot of the girls. The smile probably looked fake because there was nothing to smile about. I just didn't enjoy it at all, and it's just not a situation I put myself in, and I just didn't like being there. Wine isn't strong enough for this shit. Over the course of the series, the show has dangled the girls over five-story holes and thrown them into a tank with a shark and slathered them in honey and covered them with bees. But even with all that said, I still think that this is one of the most vicious things that it's ever done because, like, like at least when they dangled them over the holes, n none of them actually fell if that makes sense. Here, the girls are actually being insulted. Like, Dupreece is not making the thing she's saying up out of thin air. She's looking at actual photos of the girls and using those photos to come up with the meanest things she can think about them. And even if in the end she was only doing it for the challenge, that doesn't mean that whatever kernels of truth were buried in her fake insults didn't affect the girls in real ways that are genuinely kind of upsetting to watch. I don't think my stomach is that big. My nose is too big. As far as my gap, she can hang that one up. The gap is staying, sucker. I just want to see Jade. I know, she'll come in here. What? The priest, nice to meet you. Everybody was concerned about what Jade may do to the priest. We thought they were gonna go head to head. Hearing Danielle say that made me think that there's a chance that the only reason they were doing this challenge at all was to actively try and piss off Jade. Like this is 100% conjecture on my part, but I wouldn't be surprised if I found out that a lot of what the producers have the girls do on this season was designed purely around trying to get the biggest reaction out of Jade that they can because, well, her reactions are so good that they'd be fools not to. Like if one week Jay came out and was like, okay girls, for this week's challenge, we're all gonna poke Jade with a stick for about an hour or so and see what happens. I don't think I'd really bat an eye. Yeah, actually, if we're being honest, that's not even that far off from this challenge we're talking about now. 
If pissing her off was their plan, though, it does not work because, well, Jade is nothing if not unpredictable. Instead of getting mad, she seems to actually be kind of flattered by the horrible shit spewing out of Dupreece's mouth in a way that's genuinely kind of charming to watch. Like, as best I can tell, Jade loves herself so much that she's genuinely unable to comprehend insults as insults if they're about her. Like, when Dupree says mean shit about her, I think the only thing that Jade pays attention to is the fact that the things being said are about her, and because Jade loves herself so much, she kind of just assumes that that means that they're compliments. You photograph really harsh. Yes. Exactly. My look is very versatile. Like a dude. I thought that would be an extra plus for me. Ooh, look at his nose. This is horrendous. Yeah. And my look's like, <laughs> I know. Dupreece, you know, she's pretty cutthroat. I've dealt with that type of, of cutthroatingness. If I could have one superpower, it would be whatever Jade just did right there. Jade's inability to listen to other people when they speak pays off for her for the first time in the competition, and she's named the winner of the challenge. She, she's told she can pick one other contestant, and the two of them will have a special prize waiting for them when they get home. Unfortunately, the girl she chooses is Nena, and the reason that's unfortunate is that the prize is that the show flies one of their loved ones into Los Angeles for a visit, which means that we get to watch Nena and her boyfriend John interact again, which like, hooray. And I honestly hate talking about this relationship like poison, so I'm gonna be nice to myself and skip over most of their interactions in this episode. But that said, I can't not show you Nena's reaction to finding out that John was the person the show flew in for her because like, it's just too good. Nina is just hugging her boyfriend. Oh, no, surprise, surprise. Huh? <laughs> For a second, split second, I thought it could be one of my sisters in the box. I don't know why I thought that it was just maybe wishful thinking. <laughs> so when I opened it and John came out, and I felt indifferent. John, just for him to be here. It's going to be kind of uh, difficult for Nina, so it's causing tension. I genuinely don't think I've ever seen anyone hate another person as much as Nena se seems to hate her own boyfriend. L like, it's honestly kind of fascinating. Unlike Nena, Jade is thrilled with the person they flew in for her, and so when she opens up the human-sized box with her name on it and sees her mom, she reacts with what I'm pretty sure is the first and only time we see her express human emotions during her tenure on the show. Is my mom in there? <laughs> Jade is just beside herself when she realizes it's her mom. Jade had opened up and started crying and that was really sweet. I haven't seen that side of Jade ever before. Jade's reaction is actually pretty common for when this sort of stuff happens on a reality show. And like, maybe I'm just dead inside. But whenever I see people break down in tears like that, when they're reunited with their loved ones, I'm always kind of surprised by it. Like, like realistically, she's been filming for five weeks or so at this point. So that doesn't seem like that long to go without seeing someone. I go five weeks without seeing people all the time, and when I do finally see them, I don't usually cry tears of joy about it. I'm usually just like, 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 hey. Anything new? That said, I think the fact that emotions run that high might honestly just be a testament to how terrible it is to film one of these shows. Like, while I definitely wouldn't sob under normal circumstances, I guess if I had spent five weeks being psychologically tortured while someone filmed it, I probably would shed a few tears if I opened up a box and found my mom in there. 
th that said, I feel like regardless of the situation, opening up a box and finding my mom would be really weird, e e even if I was really happy to see her. And like, I'm not gonna lie, finding out that Jade has a mom is kind of jarring because it humanizes her in a way that I didn't know was possible until now. Like, I guess I already knew on some level that she must have had a mom and a childhood and stuff, but I think up until this point, part of me kind of assumed that she was born when a reality TV producer had a headache and then a PA chiseled a hole in his skull to try and make it go away, and, and then Jade just sprung out of that hole, fully formed, ready for cycle six. Thankfully, Jade is perfect in literally every way, so even when she's being humanized, she still somehow manages to keep getting weirder. We learn that her mom is an energy healer, so we then watch Jade as she gets her energy healed, I guess. I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but it's interesting to watch. What makes it even more interesting to watch is the fact that this is where we learn that Jade is also a poet because, well, of course she is, she's perfect. And so while she's being healed, we get to hear one of her poems. I wrote something today and I'd like to share it. Heaven and hell, earth power, wind force. Make me listen and my strength will be my source. Thanks, man. There's so much beauty in the world. Up next, we get to watch the first of our two photo shoots this week, where the girls are tasked with portraying dolls. And while this is probably my favorite shoot of the season, rewatching it with the theme of the week in mind adds some extremely dark undercurrents to the setup that I, I never really picked up on until now. The fact that they had the girls portray dolls on the week that they were teaching the girls about the ugly side of modeling kind of feels like they're saying that being a model means being this soulless thing whose only job is to sit still and look pretty because, well, whether that's what they meant by this photo shoot or not, that does genuinely seem to be the main lesson they're trying to impart on the girls this week. Still, evil or not, it's a good photo shoot in a lot of ways, and one of those ways is that it gives yet another example of top models struggling to come up with enough different versions of an idea, so there's one for every contestant. Joni, you are going to be a ventriloquist doll. Sarah, you are going to be a teen doll. Veranda, you are going to be a rag doll. <laughs> Jade, there was only one person you could be. A mannequin doll. Literally just say mannequin. It fits the prompt fine. You don't need to try and trick us by adding the word doll at the end of it. Nobody has ever said the phrase mannequin doll. Stretch or not though, having Jade pose as a mannequin doll is a stroke of genius because she rocks the assignment in a way that's like, like actually kind of scary, if we're being honest. Ooh, you're looking so eerie like a real mannequin, Jade. It's That's the idea, crazy. right? That's uncanny. Like, it's a good thing we just met Jade's mom, because otherwise, after seeing that, I would 100% believe that she was actually just a mannequin who came to life by way of a witch's curse. Actually, come to think of it, maybe that's what Jade's mom was doing when she was healing her energy. That, that honestly makes too much sense not to be true. I'm scared now. Another highlight of this photo shoot is that it continues the subplot of Sarah being the street chic girl of the season in a way that's very, very funny. 
She's basically supposed to be a Bratz doll, so they dress her in what a white person in the mid-2000s would think that a female rapper would wear and make her stand in a giant box. Move. What did you say? Sarah? Dolls are a little tighter. They wouldn't be packaged into a box like this. And like, I feel like it makes sense given her present circumstances, but I don't think I've ever seen a person look less comfortable than Sarah does in that moment. I feel like I've said that exact sentence a lot about Sarah over the course of this series, but that's just because she keeps getting more and more noticeably uncomfortable with the shit that she has to do in this competition. Also, watching that made me realize that there are a lot of human-sized boxes in this episode. I, I don't know what to make of that, but I felt like I should point it out because it does kind of creep me out a bit for some reason. Unlike Sarah, Joni genuinely rocks it as a ventriloquist dummy, delivering what I genuinely think might be one of the best photo shoot performances of the entire series. <laughs> Good. Like I honestly loved that photo so much as a kid that I used to bend my knees the way she did when I sat because I thought it looked cool. It wasn't until later that I realized that the only reason it looked cool is because she's a tall gorgeous lady with nice legs so me doing it with my stubby little boy potato body didn't really garner the same effect. Mostly people just thought I sat weird. As always, I wanted to do my own version of the photo shoot, and when it came time to pick what doll I was going to pose as, the choice was obvious. I'm not gonna lie, another reason that this episode took so long is that getting that outfit together was probably the most work I've put into this series to date. After rocking the shoot, Joni firmly establishes herself alongside Danielle as one of the strongest girls in the competition, and because the two frontrunners are also the two with noticeable imperfections in their teeth, the show decides to spring for a little trip to the dentist. They, they weren't about to risk having a winner with bad teeth, because like... Ew. I'm going to skip over a lot of what happens next because for whatever reason, reality shows in the 2000s had a massive boner for showing surgeries and they're never fun to watch. Like, I'm not one for promoting censorship, but I honestly don't even know how they were allowed to show a lot of the stuff that they showed, like, constantly on network television in the mid-2000s. Like, I remember when I was younger, I used to watch this show called The Swan, which, like, if you think Top Model is bad, just know that The Swan blows it out of the water in literally every way. And the one thing that I remember from The Swan is that every episode they would show these massive reconstructive surgeries, and so they'd always have shots of women with just, like, their guts spilling out all over an operating table, and in the same shot as that, they would also still always have to blur out their nipples as though that was the offensive part. Even as a kid, that always struck me as odd. Also, side note, but if any of you watching this are Real Housewives fans, know that the surgeon on the swan was Terry Dubrow, who is the husband of Heather Dubrow, who is on the Orange County iteration of the franchise. And I feel like more people should be aware of that because Heather's whole character is that she's this prim, proper person who's better than you, but I feel like you lose the ability to be holier than thou the second you marry the guy from the swan. In the immortal words of Countess Luann, money can't buy you class. Hashtag Team Noella. Wait, what was I talking about again? Oh, right, Joni. Basically, the only thing you need to know is that Joni sits through a lot of painful looking surgery in order to fix her teeth. and. 
Though it's gross to watch, it's actually very nice for her because her snaggletooth has clearly been something she's dealt with her entire life and she's very clearly happy to have it fixed. So I'm happy for her. She's emotional right now. What's wrong, Joni? I'm happy, right? Your tears are joy. <laughs> That's so cool. Aww. Mm -hmm. You can never afford anything like that. If we could go to the dentist for a checkup every year, we are lucky. I never got braces or anything like that. Of course, this is top model, so things obviously can't just be nice. And that's where Danielle comes in, because unlike Joni, she does not want the surgery being offered to her. And th though you'd think that her saying that would be the end of the story, of course it is not. We'll get to that later though, because for now it's time for a nice little visit from Janice Dickinson, because, well, no problematic episode of Top Model Bingo Card would be complete without Janice. Janice is here because, well, I'm not entirely sure why Janice is here, if we're being honest. I guess she's meant to be a mentor to the girls and teach them a lesson about this week's theme of the ugly side of modeling, but, for the life of me, I cannot tell what lesson she was trying to teach. I'm here to talk about da -da -da -da, the dark side of modeling. The ugly side of modeling exists. The ugly side of modeling will get them if they don't know how to prevent it. Big zero no-no is alcohol, which is my big thing. Example, when I was hired for my first Valentino fashion show, I got to the booking. There was a lot of champagne backstage. I knocked back two glasses of champagne. As soon as I walked down the end of the runway, I kept walking and I walked off the runway and did a loop-de-loop -loop <laughs> into the laps of Sofia Loren and Marcella Mastroianni. So I severed a huge career with Valentino. Like as best I can tell, her advice there was don't be an alcoholic, which like, not really advice. It's not like something you choose to do. I feel like Janice was telling that story to be like, here's something stupid I did, but I honestly feel like it's one of the few times where I actually don't think that Janice is in the wrong. Like based on what I know about her history, it kind of just sounds like she needed help more than anything in that moment. So the fact that her takeaway was like, welp, guess I lost the job, feels very dark to me. And then the fact that television producers let her on to a national television show and allowed her to pass that takeaway off as a lesson to a bunch of young women f f feels even darker. After Janice's lesson, the girls are driven to an undisclosed location for yet another photo shoot, only this time it has the added benefit of being directed by Tyra herself. And while the setup for the last photo shoot felt dark because of the subtext, this one is upsetting in much more overt ways. Everybody thinks modeling is glamour and fabulous and, and beautiful, but there's an ugly side. Yes. And I have shed so many tears in this industry. So today you're going to be doing a photo shoot directed by me and you're going to be crying in the photo shoot. Basically, the girls are going to be doing black and white beauty shots in which they will be crying because, well, I honestly think that the whole goal of this week was just to try and make the girls cry. So I feel like with this one, they were like, fuck it, let's just cut out the middleman. Although that said, given that the theme of the episode was the ugly side of modeling, the fact that they only have the girls doing beauty shots is honestly kind of a relief. Like, I feel like it would not be out of the realm of possibility for Jay to come out and be like, the ugly side of modeling means that sometimes you girls are going to get mauled by a bear. And and then the girls would have to pose with a bear because like, actually wait, have they posed with a bear before? They've done shark, bull, alligator, sheep for some reason. I don't think they ever actually pose with a bear, but I do think at one point they take posing lessons from a bear. I wish I was making that up, but I'm not. 
God, I love this show. Still, for as comparatively not terrible as this shoot is, the show still manages to do it in the worst way possible by rubbing the contestants' eyes with something called a tear stick, and like, I don't know what that is exactly, but from what I can tell, it isn't pleasant. You tear up. Are you ready, Miss Danielle? Yeah, I'm definitely crying. It's supposed to burn. So Tom, what is this you put in my eye? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I'm crying because like the menthol is steady making my tears flow, but I want to scream. It, it was really bad. Okay, here we go. I'm pour in. Okay. Go a little better? No, that's better. better. Okay. Also, not gonna lie, but watching them pour a bottle of water down Danielle's face did make me wonder, like, why not just start with that? S simulating tears it isn't that hard to do, so I feel like they probably could have figured out a way of doing it that didn't involve burning the girl's retinas in some way. That said though, I still think that this is probably one of the best photo shoots of the season, and I think that is 100% due to the fact that Tyra is on the sidelines coaching the girls. Like, say what you will about her, but Tyra knows what it takes to get a good photo. Sarah, so I need you to think old movie star, like you're sad and you're crying. Nice, Sarah. Crazy that I'm getting you know, kind of a one-on-one -on -one lesson from Tyra Banks on modeling. <laughs> Stick your neck out. There you go. Good. Hey, right. yay! I've talked about it before when talking about Miss J, but I think one of my favorite parts of this show is watching people be experts in ways that I didn't even realize were possible. Like, Tyra has a shockingly cerebral approach to modeling, and watching her give advice about seemingly minor details that end up making a huge difference in the ultimate outcome of the photograph makes it very clear to anyone watching why she's one of the first people you think of when you think of a model. You don't have to act that much. The tears are on your face, so that's already doing half the work, okay? I want you to watch me, because okay. it's not like, because what you're doing is you're doing real tears, you're going like, so look at the picture that I'm creating. Tyra is a wonderful director, and she was just giving me thoughts to put in my head. It's more like, <sighs> so I tried to give Tyra what she asked for. Push your body forward again, like into it. Into it. Watching Tyra give notes made me feel like she's probably the only reason that this show works as well as it does, because she's so good at being able to put into words all the intricacies of what it takes to be a model that she does elevate the competition aspect of this show. Like in someone else's hands, Top Model very easily could have read as a beauty contest, but with Tyra, it genuinely feels like a talent show, and that's because for her, modeling is genuinely a talent. Like, she's so good at it that if you watch this show long enough, you do start to buy into the idea that modeling is this weird sort of meritocracy where anyone with the right look will inevitably rise to the top provided they know all the right tips and tricks. Like, like it honestly took me longer than I care to admit, to realize that that's probably not actually, actually the case. My opinion on the matter changed when I was watching an episode of The Real Housewives years later, and on it, one of the wives went to visit their aspiring model daughter on set, and like, it, it was one of the first times I had seen actual modeling take place outside of Top Model, and like, it was very different than what's shown on this show. Like literally all the daughter was doing was like jumping around in the desert and basically just existing as a hot person in front of the camera. And truth told, she was getting better, more professional looking photos than 99% of what comes out of Top Model. Watching it, I kind of realized like, oh, I, I guess you can be successful just by being hot enough to take a pretty picture. Like, like, don't get me wrong, I think that the things Tyra talks about are helpful to being a model, but I don't necessarily think that they're required to be successful in the field. That said though, fingers crossed Tyra's tips do help because I have a second photo shoot I need to do on this episode, and let's be honest, I'm gonna need all the help I can get if I'm gonna make a, a beauty shot work. In order to properly recreate the shoot, I have also purchased a tear stick and, well, I'm absolutely terrified to use it on myself. Let's be honest, if Danielle complains about how much it hurts, then it does not bode well for me. I'm very weak.
Also, not for nothing, but the only tear stick I could find online was very cheap. It had to be shipped from India, and it took about a month to get here. So I'm worried that I got, like, the Wish.com version of the eye torture stick. Not gonna lie, I'm not really feeling confident in the safety of what I'm about to do because there's a solid chance this is just like Vaseline mixed with pepper spray. I guess those are the risks you take when you become a YouTuber. Ugh. Fuck. This is not gonna be good. All right, as you can see, I added some, um, some black eye makeup so that you can see the, 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 the rain coming out of my eyes. That's not the right word. As you can tell, I'm a little bit nervous to actually do this, but like, I'm committed. I, I'm gonna do it, I promise. Just, just need a second of psyching myself up. Okay, 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 I'm gonna do it. So I will take this and I lost the box that tells me how, but I don't think it was in English anyway, so I don't think, um, so let's see, I think I just go, oh, oh boy. Oh. Ow. So like, um, I don't know if you've ever cut onions, but like if you cut onions and mix it with mint, oh my God. Ow. Ow. <laughs> God damn it. I don't think I can open my eyes. <laughs> Am I tearing? It feels like I, I, I poured like Listerine in my eyes. Like it doesn't hurt, but I'm also not entirely sure if I can open them up. Why would they do this on the show? Just pour water down their face, Jesus. Okay. So um, I think I actually have to sit here a little while before I can um, actually take the photos because I, I genuinely, like, it feels very counterintuitive for me to open my eyes. Oh, no, no. All right. I can kind of open my eyes now, but I don't really feel any tears. Do I have tears? No. Why is it making me sniffly? Like it's making me cry in other aspects, but it's not making me tear. God, this is gonna be a bitch to edit. It doesn't hurt, it's just weird. Like, like it feels like someone put like spearmint gum on my eyeballs. Oh, there's a tear. And my makeup didn't smudge. So I feel like I should just do this. And that looks more like I cried. Or does it look like war paint? I guess it's time for the photo now. So, um, ugh, ugh. One of the tears got in my mouth. All right, time for the photo. Um, so I'm going to take all of Tyra's tips, which are basically just like, 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 Purse your lips a little bit and do your eyes sort of like a, there's a lot of hand work. So it's like No, that's no good. Alright, I'm gonna get this right. So stick out your neck, put your tongue, stick out your neck, purse your lips, make your eyes good. Find the light. Put this hand thing here, that for some reason. All 
All right, here we go. All right, I'll take it. All right, fingers crossed I can still read my fucking script after that. Jesus. You'd think that nearly blinding myself with a lipstick made of hell jelly would be the low point of making this video, but you'd be wrong because right now we're going to talk about the moment that I've been dreading since... Well, basically since I set out to start making videos about Cycle 6 of Top Model. Not only is this one of the most controversial moments in the history of reality television, but it's also so fucked up in so many ways that even though I've been putting off talking about it for... four months now, I still don't really feel entirely ready. That said, there's no time like the present, so let's do this. Where's my flask? After the photo shoot with Tyra, it's time for judging. And when it comes time for Danielle's turn to, to be judged, Tyra is not happy because Danielle didn't get the surgery the show wanted her to get. If we're being honest, I also wasn't happy at this moment in time, but not because of the fact that Danielle didn't have oral surgery so much as the fact that it was at this exact moment that I fully accepted that I will one day burn in hell for watching this show. So Danielle, you went to the dentist, but you refused to have your gap closed. Do you really think you can have a CoverGirl contract with the gap in your mouth? Yeah, why not? This is all people see. It's easy reads beautiful CoverGirl. It's not marketable. Yeah, just a little bit is okay, but I don't want to completely close it. Well, I guess she just left the gap wide open for another girl, baby. I agree. This is opium. The, the, the stuff, the stuff in my flask was not strong enough. So basically what happened here is that the judges offered Danielle the surgery because they believed it would make her more marketable. And when she refused it, they took that as a sign that she wasn't willing to do everything it took to win, which in the world of Top Model is just about the worst thing a contestant could do. Like, I'm not even kidding. You could probably take a poop on the floor in the middle of judging, and while that would probably land you in the bottom two, there's still a chance you'll make it to the next week provided you're able to demonstrate enough drive. They never outright say it, but they very heavily imply that if she wants to continue on in the competition, Danielle would need to surgically alter her own appearance in a way that she does not want to do. Wh which, which sounds like the description for, for a psychological horror film, but it's really just, just prime time, baby. Full disclosure, what happens next happens in the next episode, but since I don't want to ever try and talk about this again after today, I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit and get this all out of the way in one fell swoop because, well, not going to lie, if I have to drag this out for another episode, I genuinely think this might be the last top model video I ever make. After judging, Danielle is pretty much left with one of two options. She could either get the surgery or get kicked out of the competition. And like, I'd say she was between a rock and a hard place, but I honestly think that doesn't do her situation justice because her literal options both sound way worse than either one of those metaphorical options. Like, rock and hard place both sound like better places to be than giving up on the biggest opportunity of your life or subjecting yourself to unwanted cosmetic surgery. Although truth told, I'm not entirely sure what a hard place is, so so, so maybe that is worse. Turn a piece of y'all, like all over again. The competition is getting really serious and Tara asked me to get the gap and my teeth closed. 
easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. Do you really think you can have a cover girl contract with the gap in your mouth? Yes, why not? This is all people see. It's easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. It's not marketable. I don't want to go home because I didn't get the gap closed. And then if it looks jank, then they're really... It's going to work out fine. You might completely love it. I doubt it. Like, I doubt it. I have to choose my gap or going home. You know, I'm at the bottom right now. I feel like that is the biggest challenge that has ever faced me. She mulls over her options for a while before ultimately talking it out with her mom, who seems awesome and basically says that Danielle should follow her heart, but if her heart is telling her that she wants to stay in the competition and that means filling in her gap, then she should do it. And so she does. I do respect Tyra's opinion. I do take heed to everything that she's saying. So I gotta suck it up, I gotta bite my lip, and I gotta get my gap closed. As much as I don't want to. And like, look, I have a lot of thoughts on this whole situation, but Danielle actually did address it years later in a video, and since she's the one at the center of it all, I feel like I should start by talking about that. Uh, I won't play it here because... Well, for being honest, I don't know how to download videos off of Instagram, but I will post a link to it below, so everyone please go watch it if you can, because I think it's necessary to understanding this whole situation. So, like, do that now. I'll wait. Actually, no, I will not wait. The pause button exists. So pause this, then go watch the video, and then come back here, and we'll discuss it. Yeah, I'm not waiting for you guys because you don't know how to use technology. Way to stand your ground, Willie. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so the basic gist of the video seems to be that Danielle wanted to make sure people knew that ultimately the choice to fill her gap was her own. And like, I guess I don't know Danielle, but based on what I do know from the show, this video is very Danielle. In it, she's way more focused on herself and her own actions than anything else in a way that's very similar to how she acts on the show. And watching it, one of my main takeaways was like, yeah, I feel like the Danielle we see on the show is accurate to who she is as a person and she seems awesome. The stuff she discusses in it actually informs a lot of her behaviors during her time on Top Model because Based on what she says here, it doesn't sound like she actually gives two shits about winning the title so much as she views winning as her opportunity for a better life. More than anything, it sounds like she just wanted to get out of her hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas, and she viewed the competition as her opportunity to do that, which explains why she comes off as so intense and driven to win here. She basically saw this as her shot, and she was going to make sure she did whatever it took to not let it slip through her fingers. Which, like, I'll be honest, there are a lot of times on the show where she'd be like, all I care about is being America's Next Top Model in a way that felt really intense, and I'd be like, okay, Danielle, chill. But when you replace being America's Next Top Model with improving my station in life and getting out of a situation I don't want to be in anymore, then her intensity makes a lot more sense. Which honestly explains why I think she spends the majority of the video talking about how the decision to get the surgery was nobody else's but her own, because, like, she did win. Using a reality competition show as your ticket to a better life isn't exactly the easiest plan to pull off, but she did. She, she worked her ass off and made all the right decisions and did the damn thing, and that's genuinely a huge accomplishment. I do think that sometimes in the world of liberal-leaning internet discourse, there can be a tendency to focus on the issue to a point that you sometimes forget the person attached to it. And I can honestly see how that would be frustrating, especially if you're someone like Danielle. Like, I don't get the sense that she'd love the idea that she'd be viewed as this poor innocent victim with no say in her own actions. So I get why enough instances of people being like, oh, poor you, I can't believe the show made you do this, would eventually make her want to stand up and be like, actually, no, I I'm a human with my own agency. Thank you. Because truth told, I honestly think that the only reason this moment sticks out as a low point for Top Model and frankly, humanity as a whole, is the fact that the show clearly wanted to make it into a moment. I, th I think Danielle just genuinely didn't understand that the show was telling her to fill in her gap, and rather than saying it in the moment that they were, 
they decided to keep things vague in order to stir up drama with Tyra at judging by making it look like Danielle wasn't willing to do everything she needed to do in order to win, which is honestly insane because of all the storylines they could have forced on Danielle, not wanting it enough is honestly the stupidest one they could have picked. Like, I genuinely feel like if they came out and were like, this week, you're going to be posing for photos, but the twist is that you're going to have to cut off your own toe while you did it. Danielle would probably be like, okay, left foot or right foot. Based on how she describes it in her video, I feel like had the show just been more direct with her, Danielle probably would have just gotten the surgery right away and the moment wouldn't have come off as recognizably horrific as it ultimately did. Like, don't get me wrong, that's not me defending the incident in any way so much as me wondering how many similarly horrible instances we overlooked because the show d didn't draw attention to them in the same way, which, like, terrifying to think about. Like, honestly, for as intrinsically ghoulish as the whole instance is, I honestly think the only reason that people remember it at all is because of this interaction that Danielle has with Tyra. Do you really think you can have a cover girl contract with a gap in your mouth? Yeah, why not? This is all people see. It's Easy Reads Beautiful Cover Girl. It's not marketable. There's a lot about that clip that makes you want to fuck off from society and join a convent, but I think that for me, the part that leaves the worst taste in my mouth is that it does kind of feel like Tyra is pulling a bit of a power trip there. Like, I've mentioned this joke I saw on Twitter a while back comparing Top Model to the Stanford Prison Experiment, and with each episode of this show that I talk about, that feels like less and less of a joke. Which, like, I wouldn't be me if I didn't give Tyra way more benefit of the doubt than she probably deserves, so I do want to point out that I don't think that Tyra is asserting her dominance here just for, like, the sake of it. Even though it really, really does look like she is. Like, I do genuinely believe that Tyra thinks that filling in her gap would give Danielle more potential for success as a model, and I do genuinely believe that Tyra wants her to be as successful as she can. N not, not for Danielle's sake, obviously, but the more successful their contestants are, the more legitimate top model seems, so I honestly don't think Tyra or anyone else on the staff has any vested interest in sabotaging anyone for the sake of drama. I also think that if Tyra is going a little bit overboard on asserting her own dominance here, it has less to do with a power trip and more to do with preserving her own public image. The, the way she's portrayed on the show is as this omnipotent superhuman who has all the answers relating to modeling. So if Danielle goes against her suggestion and turns out to be right, then that spits in the face of the narrative that the show has clearly gone to great lengths to construct for Tyra. And if that is the case, then that sucks for Tyra because Danielle ultimately did turn out to be right. Kinda. I remember seeing a makeup commercial a few years later where the model in it had a big ass gap in the middle of her teeth and I remember instantly being mad on Danielle's behalf. Like, here was a model with a much larger platform than anything offered to the winner of America's Next Top Model, and clearly nobody made her get surgery she didn't want. Like, like honestly, as best I could tell, her gap was her selling point. Like, hell, Top Model itself even eventually embraced the gap tooth look, because the only other instance I could think of of the show forcing oral surgery on a contestant came in cycle 15, when part of one of the girls' makeovers included a procedure to, to enlarge the tooth gap that she had in order to make her look more high fashion. And like, if I were Danielle watching that, I'd be so angry that my TV would probably explode from the sheer force of my rage. I remember watching that commercial and thinking like, wow, Tyra was wrong. And I remember being genuinely shocked by that. Like, say what you will about her, but she genuinely knows her shit. Like I said, I think that it's Tyra's extreme levels of expertise that elevates the show beyond what it might have been. I, I know that's hard to believe, given how unelevated the show ultimately is, but I do think that it's true. 
Like I said, in someone else's hands, this very easily could have been a beauty contest, but I don't think that's the case. Granted, everyone on the show is extremely beautiful, but I think that all that does is get you through the door. I think that once they've decided that you're not a gross subhuman like the rest of us, your physical appearance is only going to get you so far. Like, obviously saying who is the hottest is subjective, but I feel like every season has at least one contestant where you look at them and you're like, oh wow, you're gorgeous. And while that will usually grant said contestant a couple of free passes, they rarely, if ever, win. I'm looking at you, Anshul. So the question then becomes that if it's not a beauty contest, then what is it? What is the goal? of the show. And I feel like the answer to that was very clearly stated in the first few moments of the season. America's Next Top Model is not just about beauty. It's a journey of transformation. And our winners have transformed into working models that are working. Basically, they're trying to find someone who can work in the fashion industry. And so to better try and understand what it means to be a model and what this show is all about, I think that we need to take a closer look at the fashion industry as a whole, which like, hooray. Always a fun thing to do. When we talk about the fashion industry, we usually talk about it as being like clothes and stuff, but it's honestly more than that. According to whatever source pops up when you Google fashion definition, the definition of fashion is a popular trend, especially in styles of dress and ornament or manners of behavior. And I think that it makes a lot of sense that the trend part of that definition comes first, because more than anything, I really think that what the fashion industry is all about is deciding what's popular. I think that Meryl Streep said it best in The Devil Wears Prada when she said this stuff. Oh, okay, I see. You think this has nothing to do with you. You go to your closet and select out, oh, I don't know, that lumpy blue sweater, for instance, because you're trying to tell the world that you take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back. But what you don't know is that that sweater is not just blue. It's not turquoise. It's not lapis. It's actually cerulean. And you're also blithely unaware of the fact that in 2002, Oscar de la Renta did a collection of cerulean gowns. And then I think it was Yves Saint Laurent, wasn't it, who showed Cerulean military jackets? I think we need a jacket here. And then Cerulean quickly showed up in the collections of eight different designers, and then it filtered down through the department stores, and then trickled on down into some tragic casual corner where you no doubt fish it out of some clearance bin. However, that blue represents millions of dollars in countless jobs, and so it's sort of comical how you think you've made a choice that exempts you from the fashion industry when in fact you're wearing a sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of stuff. God, what a good movie. They call the clackers. <clears throat> the fashion industry really is just a microcosm of society as a whole. It's a bunch of people doing their best to stay two steps ahead of whatever the next trend is going to be so that by the time the rest of us catch up, they can capitalize on it by saying that they were there first. And when you think about it like that, you realize that the stuff that happens on runways and in design houses truly does ripple out and affect the rest of us in genuine, tangible ways. E even if you're someone like me who couldn't be fashionable if my life depended on it. Although I do like these colors on me. And I think it works both ways. The stuff that happens in society has ripple effects on what gets shown in the runways and in fashion houses too. Like, though I'm sure there are a lot of people in the fashion industry who would disagree with me on this one, I don't think that there's anyone who can actually just dictate what's on trend without a whole mess of other people's help. Like, I feel like in that monologue that I just knocked out of the park, Oscar de la Renta was only able to make Cerulean popular because Cerulean is pretty and there was enough of a market for it out there. Like, I feel like if he were to like, like take a dump on somebody's chest and then send them out onto the runway, he probably wouldn't be able to usher in a whole new era where chest dumps are in vogue. 
Actually, maybe he could because there are a lot of people out there who are willing to do anything so long as an expensive designer tells them to, but for designers to get to the point where they can start pushing chest dumps, I feel like they have to cultivate a level of respect and in order to do that, they have to figure out what people want to see and then give it to them. Although is Oscar de la Renta a real person or is he like, like, a, like a fancy version of Captain Crunch? I, I always think that people are real and then it turns out that they were just made up to sell clothes. So then you have this weird push and pull that happens. People react to trends and then trends evolve based on those reactions. And then people's reactions change based on the new trends and then new trends pop up based on those new reactions. And then it just kind of continues like that until we're all killed by climate change. And if this is actually how things work, then it's weird to say, but I think that a lot of the really fucked up stuff that happens in the fashion industry and honestly in society as a whole does ultimately come from a positive place. Which is not to say that it comes from a good place though. What I mean by positive is that I think that most of these trends come much more from people saying yes to the things that they like rather than from people saying no to the things that they don't. Like, I don't think that most cases of toxic trends start with people being like, well, let's give people eating disorders because I hate anyone who isn't a size zero. I think, unfortunately, what happened there is that skinny people were the ones who were most positively received by the most amount of people. And so that signaled to the fashion industry that people wanted to see skinny people, so that's what they gave them. And then things just sort of went back and forth, like I described earlier, and the trend just kept moving more and more towards skinnier and skinny peepier. In their quest to figure out what's marketable, they end up taking things to the nth degree and creating these impossible ideals. And then those impossible ideals trickle back down to the rest of us and inform the society we exist in. And then those tastes that were influenced by those impossible ideals trickle back up to the fashion industry who uses them to create new impossible ideals. And though all of this is ultimately just people following the trends, it ends up creating ripple effects that end up harming a lot of people's positions in society. And the further you fall from those impossible ideals, the worse things get for you. I'm not sure if this is a good comparison exactly, but the way I kind of think about it is like a Ouija board, you know? We all kind of have our hands on the planchette and when it starts to move, it feels like there must be some magical force that's controlling things, but really it's just a bunch of people pushing it in different directions in ways that maybe they don't even realize. And this is all to say that I think that more than anything, the fashion industry is just an extreme reflection of where society has been and where society is going. It's weird and it's over the top and it's not something that the majority of us really relate to, but as Miranda Priestly said, we're none of us really that removed from it at the end of the day. So the question then becomes if the fashion industry is really just a weird, funhouse mirror distillation of society as a whole, then what does that mean for models? And the more I think about it in this light, the darker my answer starts to feel. Which I guess is appropriate given the subject matter of, of, of this particular episode of Top Model that we're discussing right now. Like honestly, I think the best answer I can come up with with what the show is talking about when they talk about a model is someone who best taps into that collective unconscious. They are the human avatar of the trends that we all create together. And the closer they are to that impossible ideal, the better shot they have of being on top. And I feel like I've been rambling a lot because, well, opium is a hell of a drug. So I think that I may have overcomplicated things a bit because honestly, everything I've been talking about is just a long-winded way of saying that a model is someone who can appeal to the most amount of people possible. Whether it's through photos or commercials or runways, really their only goal is to get enough people to say like, 
I like that person enough that I want to be like them. And so in order to be more like them, I will purchase whatever it is that they're selling. When Tyra talks about trying to find working models who are working, basically what that means is she's looking for a girl who can go to as many designers and producers and editors as possible and have them think, yes, she will sell. It's not the most satisfying explanation, but when you look at Top Model through that lens, it honestly explains a lot about the show. It explains why personality plays such a big role in the show, because if you can charm people, that's going to make them like you, and that's ultimately the name of the game. It explains why the rules of the show seem to be wildly different depending on the season, because fashions are constantly changing, so it makes sense that the rules would too. Most importantly, it explains why a lot of the show seems like the judges are just picking their favorites and pushing them forward regardless of their performance, because they basically are. If you manage to be the judge's favorite regardless of how you make it happen, that means you're doing well in the competition, because making people like you is ultimately the point of the game. Like, while I wouldn't say that Top Model is a beauty contest, I would absolutely say that it's a popularity contest, because at the end of the day, that's really all it is. It just happens to be the case that what's popular is being judged by a group of people whose minds have been totally warped by the worlds of fashion and television production. Also, speaking of popular, I'm about to get a lot less of that with a lot of you. Popular. I'm, I'm about to get a lot less popular. That was a terrible transition, but what I meant to say is that a lot of you are going to hate me after I say what I'm about to. Because remember earlier when I said kinda after I said that Danielle was ultimately proven right about not wanting to close her tooth gap? Well, there's a reason for that kinda. And when I say what that is, you guys are probably going to try and throw a bunch of tomatoes at me through your computer screens. Because here's the thing. Well, I do definitely think that Danielle was ultimately right, I also don't necessarily think that Tyra was wrong. Right? Computer screens don't work that way? Good. I'm bad with technology, what can I say? Like, don't get me wrong, morally, Tyra was absolutely in the wrong here, but as an expert in modeling, trying to help Danielle further her career, I do get why she would be insistent that Danielle fill her gap, because in the moment, as best I could tell, tooth gaps were not on trend, and though I love her and think she's awesome, I don't think that Danielle was going to be the one to change that. Because remember when I talked about that commercial where I saw a high-profile model with a gap in her teeth for the first time? Well, I left out a detail about her that I don't think is entirely insignificant. When making this video, I decided to look her up, and after some digging, I found that her name is Georgia Mae Jagger. And if that last name sounds familiar, then there's a good reason for that, and that's because she got it from her father, Mick Jagger, who was who a very famous musician. Although I'm sure you guys already know that. And like, I feel like it should be immediately obvious to any of you watching why Mick Jagger's daughter might have an easier time landing a modeling contract with a gap in her teeth than Danielle might, but just in case it's not, then why don't I break down the differences between these two women because... Well, obviously, there's a lot of them. For starters, there's the marketability of it all. Like, if the goal of a model is to be someone that people look at and want to see themselves in, then having Mick Jagger's daughter on your payroll sounds like a no-brainer, because who doesn't want to be Mick Jagger's daughter? That, that sounds awesome. I mean, I'm sure it's not, because I doubt he's a great father, but on paper, it sounds pretty cool. For as much as I love her, Danielle does not have the same kind of clout. Like, I feel like if you're Mick Jagger's daughter, you can just go into a casting agency and fart really loud and people would be like, yes, I'm listening. But Danielle is obviously going to have to work a lot harder to get them on her side because 
She doesn't have any innate selling point about her that's going to put her over the edge. Also, speaking of casting directors, in order to get them to hire you, you're going to need to get in the same room as one of them. And I got to imagine it's a lot easier for Mick Jagger's daughter to do that than Danielle. All of what Danielle talked about in her video was that her entire run on the show was her attempt to get out of Little Rock, Arkansas. So my guess is that she didn't really run into that many fashion industry professionals in her day-to-day -day life. I mean, be honest, how many casting directors for Rimmel London do you think are living in Little Rock, Arkansas? Like at most there are five. So Danielle's chances of running into one of them aren't great. Also, speaking of that whole Danielle literally had to try her hand at winning an insane reality show in order to get out of her hometown situation, let's talk about access to resources because my guess is that Mick Jagger's daughter never had to jump through those kind of hoops in order to travel. I'll be, I'll be honest, it'd be pretty weird if she did. I, I actually feel like Danielle's situation there is pretty unique, all, all things considered. So not only is Danielle not in a place where she's likely to get noticed by anyone who can further her career, but moving somewhere to change that is an incredibly complicated process for her. It sucks ass, but I don't think that Tyra is wrong in saying that Danielle would be smart to make sacrifices like filling her gap in in order to maximize her chances at getting hired because on the off chance that she's lucky enough to find herself in front of a casting director and it doesn't work out for her, who the hell knows when she'll have an opportunity like that again. And easy access to travel isn't the only way having more money and resources would make someone's life a lot easier. Saying what I just said out loud like that, it feels like kind of an obvious statement, but that said, it's true, so I'll say it anyway. Shut up. The way she describes it in her video, Danielle was more or less fighting for her life. I don't get the sense that she had the same safety net as Mick Jagger's daughter because, well, I assume that most people don't have the same safety nets as Mick Jagger's daughter, and let's be honest, it's a lot easier to say no, I'm not changing my gap and slam the door in a casting director's face if slamming the door in a casting director's face doesn't mean you won't eat that week. And maybe I'm being too harsh on Mick Jagger's daughter because truth told, I'm doing a lot of speculation here and I don't actually know how much of what I'm saying about her is actually true. but. That said, even if she did all her castings under a pseudonym and never got a dime from her sexy dad, there's still a good chance that she'd be able to keep her gap and make it work as a model a lot easier than Danielle could. Like for starters, she's English. I, I don't know how it would work in other countries, but in America, an English accent connotes wealth and a certain level of exoticism that I do believe would make her gap more marketable in a lot of ways. Like. I'm not proud of it, but I do feel like there's some part of me that would see an English person with a gap and immediately think like, ooh, gaps must be all the rage in London. Very posh indeed. Danielle, on the other hand, happens to come from the American South, and she has the accent to boot, and unfortunately for her, being Southern and having a gap in your tooth comes with its own set of preconceptions. They're classist and they suck, but they exist, and that's bound to be a knock against Danielle's chances of getting hired, unfortunately. Like, I don't think that Danielle fits in to any of those stereotypes in literally any way, but I also don't think that that matters. Like, a casting director's job is presumably to find the girl that the most amount of people are going to want to see themselves in, and because those harmful preconceptions exist in the world, it's likely to be a knock against Danielle in a lot of situations. Like, the casting director doesn't even necessarily have to agree with the harmful preconceptions. So long as they're aware of their existence, there's a good chance that they'll influence their decision on some level. Like, if they do their job like I do mine, odds are they're not gonna be like, yes, this will be a tough sell, but let's spit in the face of society's preconceptions. Free to bet. My guess is that it's much more likely that they'd think something like, well, I wish it wasn't the case, but 
that girl probably won't be as easy of a sell, so I'm going to hire somebody else because more than anything, I just want to be done with work so I can go home right now. I've said it before in my videos, but I do firmly believe that everyone's collective desire to just get home and be done for the day influences way more of our society than we realize. Hell, the casting director doesn't even need to be aware of the stereotype for it to fuck someone like Danielle over. Like, I bet if you ask most casting directors, they'd probably say they're just going with their gut. But I feel like what that means is that they're so used to the whims of the world that we live in that they're able to tap into that collective unconscious that I talked about earlier. And that collective unconscious just happens to be where most of this shit lives. These harmful preconceptions are so deeply ingrained into so many of us by the society we live in that they don't even need to cross our minds in order to affect our decisions. And by affecting our decisions, they end up affecting the lives of the people around us. Which like speaking of harmful preconceptions that are deeply ingrained into many of us by the society we live in. Let's talk about the other major difference between Mick Jagger's daughter and Danielle, the one that I've been dreading talking about since I started this video, because truth told, I probably shouldn't be giving my opinion on it anyway, and I probably would not have had I not committed myself to making this series like the idiot that I am. I don't think that I can properly discuss this whole situation without acknowledging the fact that Danielle is a woman of color. And truth told, even once I do acknowledge that fact, uh, I still probably can't properly discuss this whole situation because I am very much not an expert on such topics because, well, well obviously, look, look at how pale I am. Still, this is the corner I've backed myself into, and I genuinely believe that Danielle's race is a not insignificant aspect of how she would be judged as a model. After all, if being a model does actually mean being some sort of human incarnation of this impossible ideal created by society, that does mean that black women will probably have a much harder time at it, because, well, traditionally, society has not been very kind to them. Like, it's weird because odds are that the majority of the trends being shown off have been stolen from black women in some way, but still, the industry showing them off generally seems to prefer having them modeled by white women because, well, everything is terrible. There are a lot of things that make me uncomfortable about Top Model, but perhaps nothing makes me more uncomfortable than the way they discuss race, because, well, obviously, L look at how pale I am. To the show's credit, they do not shy away from discussing the reality that the fashion industry is generally pretty racist, but then in their efforts to try and be realistic, to the realities of the fashion industry, the show itself ends up being generally pretty racist as well, which like, not great. There, there are many, many times over the course of the series when the contestants of color feel like they are being held to different, higher standards than their white counterparts because, well, they almost certainly are. As far as this double standard relates to Danielle, I think it can be summed up in one word that gets tossed around a lot on this show, and that word is high fashion. Even though they say it like every other word on this show, I don't actually think that there's a set definition for what counts as high fashion in the way that they talk about it. But if I had to try and explain what they seem to mean, when they say it, I'd say it's like fashion industry speak for weird, but, but like in a nice way. A lot of the things that people call high fashion on this show are kind of like a hook, if that makes sense. Not, not like a literal hook though, a metaphorical hook. Although that said, if a girl came on with a hook for a hand, they'd probably call it high fashion. 
Like, I think that if you are a stunningly gorgeous woman with absolutely no faults at all, then you are a commercial model. But if you are a stunningly gorgeous woman with absolutely no faults at all, but your ears are big, then you're high fashion. By deviating from the norm in some way, you become more interesting. And so long as literally everything else about you is perfect enough to make it so that you still look flawless overall, then your one abnormality can actually be celebrated for its uniqueness. But, but, but seriously, literally everything else about you has to be perfect for this to work. In that later season I talked about, when they actually widen a contestant's tooth gap, I'm pretty sure that the reason they gave for why they were doing that was so that they could make her high fashion. I'm not entirely sure that that's the reason, and I don't really feel like doing research to confirm it, but it would make sense if it was, because from what I can tell, a tooth gap would make that particular contestant look more high fashion. Uh, of course, that particular contestant was white, so... The word high fashion does not get used nearly as much on the black contestants as it does on the white ones, and I think the reason for that is... well, racism. Uh, I was trying to think of a more interesting way to put that, but everything I could think of was just a fancy way of saying racism, so uh, I figured I'd keep it simple. The way they discuss a contestant's race on this show makes it seem like someone's blackness is their one allotted deviation from the norm. Like, if it is a model's job to get as close as they can to some impossible ideal created by society, then I think it's probably safe to say that that impossible ideal is white, and anyone who isn't white is put at an innate disadvantage. Which, like, like super not saying that that's how it should be, but, but, but as best I can tell based on what I've seen on, from the show, it, it is. When black contestants do get the high fashion edit, it's usually done in a way that seems to me to exoticize their skin color in some way. Like, if I were to try and guess which black contestant from this season would be most likely to be described as high fashion, I would probably say it was Nena, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why they spend so much time highlighting her African heritage. Nina. I love this girl's face. I feel like the fashion industry is in love with and obsessed with girls from Africa. This is Eddie Murphy and Iman's baby. It is coming to America. That said though, if I'm right, I think it's very strange that Nena would be seen as higher fashion because she's basically just a Barbie doll. Like, if you told me that she was actually created by an AI designed to figure out what the perfect female face would look like according to science, I feel like I would believe that because to my eyes, none of Nena's features are particularly distinctive. Like, like, like she honestly just looks like a flawless human being to me. Top Model doesn't really seem to see it that way though. Like, the show treats her as though she has this unique look, but I honestly think that it only seems unique because she exists in a world where people who look like her are grossly underrepresented. She, she's so physically perfect that they celebrate her skin color, but it feels like they're celebrating her skin color in the same way that they might celebrate a white woman's large ears, which like, that, that's, that's actually pretty icky when you stop to think about it. Meanwhile, you look at the way they treat someone like Feranda and it's very different. Like, in a lot of ways, Feranda is kind of treated like she's this extremely normal girl who should just be happy to be there at all. Her storyline is less, she's got the makings of a top model and more, like, obviously she's not going to win, but look at how far someone so average can get with Tyra's help. And that's honestly pretty weird to me because Feranda's features are a lot more in line with what the show would normally classify as high fashion. She's lanky, she has big eyes, her head shape is unusual. She looks like a praying mantis. I know that all sounds like I'm being actively rude, but these are actually all traits that the show would normally celebrate a lot more than they seem to in Feranda's case. Like, this is obviously an extremely difficult game to play, but I do think that were Feranda a white woman, her edit would have been extremely different from what we see here. In a perfect world, 
Well, in a perfect world, this show wouldn't exist. But in a world where everything is perfect except the existence of Top Model, I feel like Feranda would have been treated more as the sweet, quirky girl, like Norell or Allison. I, I did those weird hand motions to remind myself to put up pictures of them in the future so, so, so that you guys know who I'm talking about. Hopefully I remembered. Don't fuck this up, future Willy. This archetype is designated for fan favorites who are so physically interesting that their storyline is usually about figuring out how to harness their unique features for good, and if they're able to do that, they usually go really far in the competition. That said, despite having similarly unique features, Feranda's appearance is rarely ever treated like the selling point that it is for the quirky girls. Instead, she's treated like this lovable also Ran who survives solely on the strength of her personality in a way that, again, leads me to believe that the show never really thought of her as someone who might win. Like, Maybe this is just the opium talking, but the more I think about it, the more it feels like it's not a coincidence that they're constantly talking about how tall Sarah is, but they never mention how tall Feranda is, despite the fact that they appear to be the same height. I, I think that the reason for this is that the show thinks that Sarah's height is worth highlighting because there's a world in which it's actually an asset to her. The way they talk about Feranda, on the other hand, makes me feel like they just ignore her height altogether because her goal is less about finding ways to stand out and more about figuring out how to fit the mold because her hook, as it were, is already the fact that she's a black woman in a world where blackness is greatly othered. And this is all just my very long, potentially very uninformed way of saying that at this point in time, a tooth gap may not have been an asset for Danielle in the same way that it would have been for a white model. Like, I feel like it might be the case that given how trends have changed since the airing of this episode, there's a solid chance that Danielle did ultimately become less marketable the moment she got her gap filled, but if she did, I think it's only because white models who were held to a different standard were allowed to be celebrated for their tooth gaps long enough that they changed the trends in a way that made it possible so that Danielle could have been celebrated for hers too. For as much as I love her, based on everything I've seen on this show and everything I've seen on whatever you call the thing that isn't this show, the, the real world, I guess, Danielle probably wasn't going to be the one to usher in the tooth gap look. At that moment in time, in judging, based on how things were, where Danielle was in her career, and a whole variety of other factors, I do genuinely believe that Tyra was probably right in saying that if Danielle wanted to further her career, she would be smart to get the surgery that the show wanted her to get. Which is really shitty. But, but, but sometimes the truth is really shitty. There are many times when Tyra talks about how the fashion industry would treat the contestants in the real world that feel extremely harsh to me. And this whole surgery situation is definitely one of those times. And when I watch those moments, there's a part of me that wants to be like, okay, Tyra, cool down. I doubt anyone is going to be that terrible. Of course, then I think about it for longer than half a second and realize that a much larger part of me would never want to presume that I know more about how someone would be treated in the fashion industry than Tyra goddamn Banks. That'd be like all those dudes who say they think that they could beat Serena Williams in a game of tennis if they played her. Because look, as I've said many times throughout this episode, you can say a lot about Tyra Lynn Banks. You know, she's problematic, she's annoying, she's over the top, she's an inhuman monster, completely devoid of a soul, and while I may not agree with you, I probably would never say you are outright wrong, because I think there's a lot of room for debate there. But one thing you cannot debate is the fact that she knows her shit when it comes to modeling, and this show is the proof of that. Which, like, for as impressed as I always am with how knowledgeable she seems to be on here, know that when I say that the show is proof that she knows her shit, I'm not talking about that. 
Top Model is a reality show, and reality shows are not usually all that indicative of reality. Like, while I obviously do think she's knowledgeable, if I were trying to prove that in a court of law, I feel like I wouldn't use one of these episodes because I feel like the only thing that they prove for sure is how skilled the editors are. But what I actually mean here is that the mere fact that she has this show at all is the real proof. But when it came time to make the show about modeling, they went straight to Tyra Banks because, and pardon me for what I'm about to say, but there's really no other way for me to say it. She is that bitch. If I were to ask 100 people to name three models, I feel very confident in saying that 100% of those people would include Tyra on their list. When you think model, you think Tyra Banks, and for her to rise to that level makes me think that she has to know her shit, because I honestly don't think that happens for her otherwise. I've said this before on here, but I do think that we take Tyra's ubiquity for granted. She is in fact a black woman, which as I very uncomfortably discussed in this video means she had all sorts of added obstacles in her way that her white counterparts did not have to face. And not only did she overcome those obstacles, but she hurtled so far over them that she ended up achieving a level of fame and success that I don't think any model today even compares to. Well, actually, there are a few I can think of who kind of come close. Remember that model I talked about seeing on The Real Housewives earlier who didn't really seem like she was doing all that much besides being hot in front of a camera? Yeah, she went on to become Gigi Hadid. Actually, I guess she was probably Gigi Hadid then too, but... Gigi Hadid just didn't mean the same thing as it does now. Although actually I guess there's a chance that she wasn't Gigi Hadid. Gigi Hadid does sound like a name you make up for yourself when you decide that you want to become a model. Whatever, I'm rambling, but uh, my point is that she's very big. And look, this is not to talk ill of Gigi Hadid in any way. Not that she would ever notice or care, but that said, she seems nice, and I have no doubt that she works very hard. Still, I do think it's very funny that the person who made me realize that making it in the fashion world didn't always mean being some hyper-qualified savant like Tyra is also the person who may very well be the closest thing we have to a modern-day supermodel. Although that said, it does make a lot of sense when you stop to think about it. Like many models, Gigi Hadid is so beautiful that it feels like you shouldn't stare directly at her, and that is probably what it took to get her in the door of the modeling world. And once she was there, I get how she would manage to rise to the top, because, like, who wouldn't want to be Gigi Hadid? She lives this glamorous life. She grew up in a mansion in Hollywood. Her mom's a real housewife. She dated one of the One Direction guys. She's friends with the littlest Kardashian, I think, and she seems to blast photos of their friendship out onto the internet for millions of people to see. If you're trying to hire someone that people are going to want to look at and say, I want to see myself in that person, then you'd honestly be stupid not to hire her. She also has a lot of other things going for her that are bound to make her path to becoming a model a lot easier. She's the daughter of a former model, so my guess is that she knew a lot of people in the fashion industry even before she started out. She, she, she seems to have had a lot of access to resources growing up, which obviously helps. And while I don't know her exact genetic makeup, she at the very least is white presenting. She has a lot of things going in her favor that would make it so that her road to becoming a world famous fashion model is going to be a lot smoother than most. And like, I guess I don't super know this for sure, but I don't get the sense that Tyra had all that. Like, as best I can tell, she came from a fairly normal background. And while that's not like a sob story, it does mean that she definitely had to do a shit ton more work than Gigi Hadid just to get to the same place as her. The system didn't work for Tyra in the same way that it worked for Gigi, so Tyra clearly had to learn how to work within the system. The more I think about it, the more I realize that all those insane modeling skills Tyra has were probably born out of necessity. 
Everything I know about her makes me think she was someone who wanted to be the best. So she figured out what it meant to be the best and did everything she could to morph herself into that. And honestly, I think that is how Tyra became Tyra. Like, I feel like one of the biggest complaints about her I hear is that she seems fake. And I feel like the reason so many people think that about her is... Well, she's probably extremely fake. Based on how much she seems to know about the fashion industry and how clearly in control she is of every facet of herself at all times, and the way she talks about who she used to be versus who she is now, I have no doubt that the Tyra we see before us was meticulously crafted by someone who is trying to turn themselves into the ultimate model. And if that's the case, then good for her because it totally worked. Although that said, I get why that would turn so many people off. I feel like the Tyra we know and I love today is the end result of years of an extremely smart person looking at the way the world works around her and saying like, people like this, people don't like that, uh, this will get me noticed. Smiling with my eyes is apparently a thing and it tends to go over well and slowly changing herself to suit those observations so that she could get as close as possible to that impossible ideal I talked about earlier and she did it so well that she kind of ended up just creating a little bit of a monster. After all, if she is in fact the ultimate model, I believe that means she's really just the ultimate reflection of society and so I get why people might hate her. Society sucks ass. Tyra does do and say a lot of problematic shit, but I do always get the slightest hint of hesitation from her. Like, most of her advice is done from the perspective of like, this is the way shit is, and I honestly don't know if this makes it any better, but I will say that I often feel the slightest bit of like, but I really wish it wasn't hiding just beneath the surface of everything she says. And honestly, I think that's why I feel for Tyra more than a lot of you guys do, because I do genuinely get the sense that she gets how shitty a lot of the stuff that happens on this show is, and she's just become so attuned to the way things are that she's kind of just ended up accepting them. There's a running thread throughout the show where a lot, if not all, of the challenges are based on things that Tyra herself had to do on her journey to becoming who she is today. And when you think about it like that, the show takes on an extra layer of sadness that I didn't know was possible given how dark and upsetting it already is on the surface. When Tyra says stuff like, this is how the real world works, and this is what I had to do. It can sometimes feel like she's saying it more for herself than for the benefit of the contestants. Like, I'll be honest, there are a lot of times where the entire existence of the show feels like Tyra crying out, trying to get the whole world to realize all the stuff she had to endure to become who she is, and while I don't think that excuses her behavior 100%, it certainly does complicate things a little bit in my eyes. Like, like Tyra to me sometimes feels like that one character at the end of every Saw movie who becomes so warped by the experience of being sawed that they end up embracing the Saw philosophy and then the next movie they end up sawing other people themselves. Saw. When she finds out that Danielle didn't want to get her gap filled, it almost feels like Tyra takes the news personally, and I honestly think that's because it does feel personal to her on some level. Her interactions with Danielle this episode kind of feel like she's talking to her younger self, giving her the advice she wishes she would have gotten to help her along the way. And that kind of makes it hard for me to be outright angry at Tyra for this whole situation because, like, she's just giving Danielle the advice she would have given herself. Along with all the challenges, it's hard not to wonder how much of the horribly problematic shit that happens on this show is also just stuff that Tyra had to deal with on her road to becoming a top model. And while I don't think that excuses her perpetuating a cycle, it does make it hard for me not to feel bad for her on some level too. It's funny because when I think about all the crazy stuff that happens on this show, I 
tend to think of it as being the result of everything being surreal and over the top, but the more I think about it, the more I think that the opposite is true. Top Model's most insane moments are the result of hyperrealism, and they just seem insane because we're not used to seeing shit like that on shows like this. When you stop to think about it, Top Model is honestly the equivalent of like if American Idol had a week where all the contestants had to shoot up on heroin before they performed because becoming a musician puts you at a higher risk of addiction and you need to learn how to play through that if you have a sold out crowd. Like I'm sure that is a lesson that a lot of musicians did have to learn, but seeing it on prime time on a reality show would still be extremely weird. I mean, think back to their challenge with Dupreece. Well, it was absolutely insane that they literally had a segment on this show where they verbally insult each one of the contestants. Do you actually think that the reason it's insane is because models in the real world don't have to deal with shit like that? Like, like, no, of course not. I assumed that that's what most of the job is. It's just weird watching that aspect highlighted so brazenly because like, well, you'd think for a show like this, you'd focus more on like the fashion and the makeup and stuff. Over the course of this episode, I've called Top Model a beauty contest and a talent contest and a popularity contest. But honestly, more than anything, it's a survival contest. It's kind of like a sexier version of Survivor or Fear Factor, only instead of braving the elements or having to talk to Joe Rogan, the thing that you have to endure here is the insane expectation that society puts on all of us. And I fear I may have gotten myself into another long opium ramble, so I apologize for how long it took to get here, but I feel like this is all just a long way of saying that I don't think that Tyra is the real villain here. And I know that that statement will not make me popular in the comments, so before I go on, let me also say this. I've done this show long enough that I've gotten enough things sent to me where I think it would be willfully ignorant for me not to at least say that a lot of Tyra's behavior in the past has been extremely toxic in a lot of ways. Like, like I will always have a soft spot for her in my heart, but I have seen enough situations where people in her orbit have been hurt that defending her is not really the hill I want to die on anymore. That said, while I'm not going to fight anyone for saying that she handled this whole Danielle situation in an extremely shitty manner, I also think it would be extremely disingenuous of me to sit up here and be like, I can't believe that Tyra did this. What an asshole she is, like I'm sure a lot of you wanted me to do when you clicked into this video. There's one part of Danielle's video that I really wish I could post in here, but again, I do not know how to download videos off of Instagram because I am not good at the tech aspects of this job, so instead, I'm just going to have to describe it. According to Danielle, there's a moment where during her back and forth with Tyra, she says that she was never expressly told that she had to fill her gap in. And Tyra looks at a producer on the sideline who kind of just shrugs. And it was at that moment that you realize that all the drama that happened here happened because there was this unknown third party who was also involved in what was going on. And if you haven't watched Danielle's video yet, I honestly think you should because I think that that moment is really important because it reminds you what Top Model actually is. It's a system. Do I think that Tyra was a huge driving force behind why Danielle ended up filling her gap? Absolutely, but I don't think that any of this happens with just the two of them in a void. There's a whole host of producers who facilitated it, and the dentist who for some reason was willing to operate on a patient who wasn't 100% on the procedure, and to a much, much lesser degree, literally everyone else in society whose tastes and beliefs contributed to someone like Tyra looking at trends and concluding that the gap in Danielle's mouth was probably going to be a liability for her. And like, does that mean I'd ever go up to somebody who said, eh, I don't really like tooth gaps in 2006 and be like, you have blood on your hands. No, of course not. That'd be way too hard to fact check. But that doesn't mean that they don't potentially have some microscopic role in the system that caused this whole situation because that's what so much of this stuff is. 
It's a bunch of people shouldering just a little bit of the blame so that eventually that blame becomes so small and spread out that it's just like this tiny little speck that's impossible for any of us to see. We talk about things being systemic a lot, but I honestly think it's hard for a lot of us to really grasp what that even means because our natural inclination is to try and put a face to things, but by its very nature, stuff like that doesn't really have a face. Like I get why people want to put all the blame on Tyra. She is so clearly the face of this show and this show is responsible for a lot of bad stuff happening to a lot of people. Ergo, it makes sense that she'd be blamed for all the bad stuff that happens. But I genuinely think that we shouldn't be treating her like the sole villain here. Not because of whatever affection I might still have for her, but rather because I think that's just way too easy. I, I don't think that the world actually works like that. Like, don't get me wrong, I do think that there are people in the world that can rightfully be called villains, but I don't think that they ever exist in a vacuum. When you put all the blame on one person, it completely ignores the system surrounding them in a way that can often end up perpetuating the problems. Especially because a lot of the time the people casting the blame are part of the system, whether they know it or not. Like, for me as a white person, for example, I was taught growing up that being a racist was the absolute worst thing you could be, but I was also not really ever taught what racism actually looked like. So I did what I think we all do and put a face to it as best I could, and in doing so, I basically ended up thinking like, well, I'm pretty sure I would have liked Martin Luther King if I were around in the 60s, so, I think I'm good. Then I clapped the dust off my hands, pat myself on the back, and went about my life. It took me longer than I care to admit to realize that it's a lot more complicated than that, and like, I'm sure I still have quite a ways to go. And in the time that it took me to realize that, I, I feel very confident in saying that I contributed to the system in a whole host of ways that I do not feel good about now. Like, I kind of felt like I know in my heart that I would never hate anyone based solely on the color of their skin or their religion or the country they were born in. And I kind of felt like that was enough, you know? I, I didn't fit the face I had put the blame on. And because of that, it let me remove any amount of blame from myself. And even recognizing that, it's still complicated because... Well, this sort of systemic shit is extremely complicated. Like, I entirely believe that we live in a deeply racist society, but I also believe that we live in a society that hates racists. You wouldn't think that would be possible, but we somehow found a way. And like, not to brag, but I like to think that I also hate capital R racists, so there is a part of me that can't help but want to distance myself from them at all costs. And like, I feel like that has sometimes ironically led me to perpetuating a lot of my own racist behaviors. Like, I'd be lying if I said that there weren't a lot of times in my life where I saw myself in something that was being deemed racist, and I honestly started to feel a little bit threatened by that. I was so worried that I would see myself as racist, or that the society around me would see me as racist, that it became that much harder to look inward and actually do my best to try and be better. Like, if you asked me if I wanted to rid the world of racism, I would of course say yes, but I'd be lying if I said that sometimes when it comes time for me to do my part, my first inclination isn't to stand up and say like, no, 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 you don't understand. I would have supported Dr. Martin Luther King. What part of that is not clear to you? That said, for as harmful as I think it can be to oversimplify shit like this, I get why we do it. It's really fucking complicated otherwise. Writing this script, I have genuinely gotten at least 12 headaches. Like, just trying to grasp the basics of this makes my head spin. So the idea that we're literally expected to live in it is honestly insane. And unfortunately, things are only gonna get more complicated. Or like, at least I hope they will. The, the further we progress as a society, the harder it's going to be to put a face on our problems. And I worry that means that just because we can't put a face on them, people are going to just start to assume that maybe they're not there. I guess I'll stick with talking about racism because... 
whatever, I've already dug my hole there. But let's say that we eventually get to the point where nobody is like actively racist. I, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon, but it's a thought experiment. So like, go with me on this one. In this alternate universe where nobody is full of hate and everyone genuinely wants equality for all, that doesn't necessarily mean that equality will be achieved. And if people of color are still being negatively affected by the system, does it really matter that no one person or group in particular is to blame for it? And like, I know a lot of you are probably thinking that this is a dumb hypothetical, but I'm like basically just describing every affluent white liberal suburb in America right now. So know that the things I'm saying aren't even that far-fetched. That's why I think if you need to put a face to this stuff, you should look more at the ones who are being affected rather than trying to figure out who's responsible for doing the affecting. Actually, doing the affecting is a really weird way to say that thought, so I'll put it a different way. Rather than putting all your focus on Tyra, spend a little more time focusing on Danielle. Like I said, I do believe that Danielle genuinely did everything right. She had a goal, and she worked extremely hard, and she was talented, and she made the right decisions based on what she was presented with, and she did achieve that goal. And Unfortunately, for as cool as that is, that's also what a lot of this systemic shit looks like. It's doing everything right and working hard and being talented and having the end result of that be different from someone else working equally hard who is equally talented just because you both exist in the same system that favors each one of you differently. It's making all the right choices based on what you've been presented with, but being presented with very different choices to make. Like, at the end of the day, Mick Jagger's daughter still has the gap in her teeth. Danielle doesn't. I feel like that's really what matters here. Oh, also Brooke gets eliminated this episode. I forgot to mention that earlier, but... Yeah. But yeah, that's my episode. Please like and subscribe and... Share your thoughts. Like, I feel like it goes without saying, but I never mean for my videos to be taken as like the end all be all of any particular discussion. And I feel like that's especially true for this one because, like, I I'm definitely not the person who should be talking about a lot of the stuff that I talked about in this episode. I just had to make this episode, and that's what came out. Also, thank you one last time to my lovely sponsor, Michael Bertrand. I I really appreciate it. You have you have no idea. Uh, if you would also like to support the show, then head down to my Patreon and give what you can or want. But, but also don't feel obligated. I feel like I've gotten so much generosity already, but I'll take whatever more y'all are willing to give me. Also, if you want to support the show, I have merch now. Uh, 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 it comes in a lot of forms. I bought a couple pieces just to make sure that, that they were okay. Uh, I got a mug, which I really like. Um, and I got this hoodie, which I love actually. It's one of my favorite hoodies now. I'm actually kind of embarrassed to wear my own merch, but I just like, I like the way it feels on me. It's a weird way to put that, but I do. Um, so that's also below, I think. It's, there should be like little, you know how the internet works. I don't need to explain it to you. Um, oh, also, uh, I was on a podcast recently, which I mention only because I had a lot of fun on it and I really like the podcast and I want it to grow. So check out Honey Baby Sweetie Love. I think it's on iTunes and other podcast places. Uh, I think I linked to it in my community page. A lot of housekeeping today. Oh well, I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but I'm going to end it here because it's very late where I am. So, uh, see you later, nitwits. Actually, welcome back, nitwits, because I still have to pose for my thumbnail like always, and while I do, the names of my lovely patrons 
are going to scroll up on the screen. I can't believe that this is actually happening. You guys are awesome. But um, yeah, so why don't I pose for my photo? Uh, I'm going to probably uh, call this one the, the time that America's Next Top Model made a girl get surgery or something like that. And I feel like the thumbnail is just going to be me and then the word problematic. Because I feel like if I say things are problematic, my views go up like tenfold. Uh, so I think that I'm going to act like things are problematic. So I'm going to smear my makeup a little bit so it looks like I've been crying really bad, hopefully. Yeah, that looks bad. And then I'm just going to, um, like, I guess I'll just be like, oh, God. So I'll be like, are you kidding me right now? Or Turn my hair out. Oh, God, it's still wet. That's gross. Um, just like, or maybe I feel like I should do something with the makeup. So I feel like I should be like, oh. I'm starting to think that I don't know what humans, what humans look like when they, when they do stuff. Oh, well, hopefully there's something in there. This video is going to be so goddamn long. Um, thank you to my patrons. See you in like a year or however long it takes me to get the next one of these up. Bye.